Welcome to Slate School and our panel discussion entitled A Deep Dive into Learner-Centered Education. Slate School is committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Idea Lab, which is a new unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers, and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you for joining us. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Julie Mountcastle and I'm head of school at Slate School. So I'll briefly introduce you to Slate School and then review the panel logistics and then we'll hear from our four expert panelists. Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experiences for learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education. And these online dialogues, like today's, are free and open to the public. We are so delighted to have all of you with us today. And once again, I'm so happy to say that I believe we have learners joining us from six continents. So now I'll describe the basic logistics of this panel. We have four amazing panelists, and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during the next hour. Each of our panelists today will give approximately two minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their key guidance and advice about learner-centered education. We'll then proceed with the panel discussion. And we invite you to submit additional questions as comments on Facebook, and we'll select some of those questions to ask the panelists today too. So we'll proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Mike Anderson. Morning, Mike. Good morning, Julie, and good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here, especially to talk about this exciting topic. This is something that's always been near and dear to my heart. So my name again is Mike Anderson, and I've been an educator all my career. I taught third, fourth, and fifth grades for 15 years. I was in East Lyme, Connecticut for six years, and then Portsmouth, New Hampshire for nine years. I was also a responsive classroom presenter and consultant for a long time. And when I left the classroom, I left to do that work full time. So for about six and a half years, I was a full time responsive classroom consultant. And now for the last five or six years, I guess, I've been an independent education consultant working with educators, primarily throughout the United States, but a little bit internationally as well. Um, and the topics that I consult about all in some ways connect with this idea of a learner centered education. A lot of the work I do is on helping schools teach social emotional learning through daily academic work. I do a lot of work with schools on effective and respectful discipline practices and policies, do a ton of work on differentiation, and especially, um, especially on thinking about differentiated learning, not necessarily differentiated instruction. And so I think that kind of connects with the topic we're talking about. I think often when we think about differentiation in schools, it's something that teachers do to kids. But when we rightly understand a learner-centered education, differentiation is something kids actually do for themselves. Um, and so I guess my piece of advice going in as I was thinking about kind of what I would say in the beginning, it, I think sometimes we think that, think that learner-centered education might be about being hands-on. It's about kids being active and there are certainly characteristics of it. But for me, one of the barometers is going into any kind of learning activity or going into a big project, does the teacher already know exactly what it's going to look like in the end? If so, we're probably not engaged in a learner-centered activity because probably if the teacher knows already what it's going to look like at the end. What we're doing then is trying to orchestrate and craft the kids and get them to whatever they've decided they're going to try and get to at the end. Um, and so I think one of the hallmarks of a learner-centered education is oftentimes teachers are, are embark on, embarking on learning journeys with kids and it's together that they figure out the destination. Um, so I guess that's something that's a thought I'll throw out to, to kick us off. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and next, I'd like to introduce you to Sherry Cleary. Morning, Sherry. Good 
Good morning, Julie, and to the rest of you, and thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Um, I have a few roles at the City University of New York and within New York State. I'm the University Dean of Early Childhood Initiatives. I uh, have the privilege of leading the work of the New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute, and I co-chair Governor Andrew Cuomo's Early Childhood Advisory Council. Um, over the years, I've had the privilege of teaching children, leading programs, uh, educating teachers at the college level and leaders, and now building systems for the state of New York. And uh, so I really had a privileged past. And when I thought about this topic and the culmination of all of my work, it boils down to um, making sure every single child has access to excellence that is not the case in our country at this moment or hasn't been ever actually. And so this notion of social justice for children uh, really is at the core of everything that I do and I do it with an extraordinary team of almost well hundreds of people but nevertheless uh, without them none of this gets done. Um, and I guess what I would say to kick us off in my frame of reference is that the essence, this is all about trusting children. And for whatever reason, this is really hard for American people to trust. They come out wired uh, and completely and totally motivated to learn that they don't require intervention or supports from us. They are entitled to uh, supports from us, but they um, learn in spite of us. And that uh, we have become a society that has um, poorly defined the notion of very moment in terms of the um, lack of civic engagement that we that we see as a people. So not to go too far afield, this notion of simply trusting children to be the learners that they already are, to, uh, to really tap innate curiosity and their innate drive to understand their world and the way it works and how they uh, explore their power within it. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have teachers and leaders who are willing to share their power with children. And that is hard. And so I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I'm excited to, to continue. <laughs> uh, and now um, I'd just like to introduce Bill Crane. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you for having me on the program. Kind of start off where Sherry left off. Um, the, um, I became interested in child-centered or learner-centered education um, when I was in graduate school back in the late 60s um, in reading Piaget and other theorists and also having our own child and then observing children around conclusion that there is something we could call natural development the development as nature intends. And this is expressed through the child's spontaneous interests. And if you, give, if you follow what the child herself is interested in and give And so uh, that, that was a, a key insight. It's not our, I, I decided it's really not our job to decide what the child should learn, but to take our cues from the child and the child's own interests. Um, over the years, I've been sort of obsessed with the fact that children are so fascinated by the natural world and animals. Um, they, um, they approach animals uh, with, a, with a deep sense of wonder. Uh, we've, um, about 10 years ago, my wife and I opened a farm sanctuary uh, for rescue, where um, animals rescued from slaughter and uh, live out their lives. We have about 100 animals and we have a lot of visitors. And to watch the children see an animal is, is, is just a tremendously moving experience. They, their sense of wonder is, um, 
they're just amazed, engrossed, enthralled, and delighted by what they see. Um, curious, interestingly, the parents miss it. Uh, the adults who bring the kids, and even the teachers, don't see the wonder. They in instead think it's their job to teach the children something. So they constantly say things like, say, say hi to the chicken, Johnny, or <laughs> do you see, uh, how, does, how does a rooster go? Sally, can you say the rooster sound? Cock-a-doodle-doo, say the rooster sound. The child is, it has been engrossed in the child and the adult distracts the child trying to give him some sort of lesson in animal sounds or something like that. And um, it's a real problem. Um, that's um, how you can, how, how to, um, I, I don't know exactly how to handle it at the time I'm thinking about it is, um, Tell a child, tell a par parent to shut up or something, you know, <laughs> and give the child a chance to uh, feel this wonder about the world. And the wonder is a driving force in a lot of great thinkers, a sense of wonder about the, the universe and the world. And um, it's a precious thing. So uh, that's sort of where I am right, right now. And um, I look forward to the further discussion. Same here. Same here. And uh, our, our fourth panelist, but not the least, is uh, Maria Drushkova. Good morning, Maria. Hello. I'm Maria, and I love mathematics. <laughs> I have a confession to make. Uh, in 1996, I founded Natural Math, an organization that makes advanced mathematics accessible to everyone in kind ways like inviting five-year-olds to make calculus their own. So we have been publishing books, uh, informal mathematics books for parents and uh, teachers of young children, organizing festivals, developing courses, all kinds of things. People ask about calculus for five-year-olds a lot though. So as a way of introduction, I want to give you a tiny taste. Do try this at home. And all you need is a piece of paper and take a piece of paper and fold it. Just fold it into any way. I choose to fold it this way. And now there are two layers and uh, you can fold it again, any which way. If you fold it sideways, draw in my rebel alliance, but I folded it this way now. And now you can see um, how many layers there are for yourself, or you can guess. So there are four. And can you imagine me folding this on and on and on and on? The paper gets so tiny, tinier and tinier to infinity. Or would you rather not imagine such a thing and just tell me, the paper will get too thick to fold, about eight, lay, eight folds in. Or oh, Maria, you'll run out of your two minute presentation time. <laughs> and this is an interesting choice, just it's an interesting choice which way to fold your paper. And even children choose that pragmatic, applied, more natural science approach in their mathematics, in their calculus, in their algebra, or they choose that um, abstract Alice in Wonderland way of imagining wild things that aren't. And you can choose to do something completely else and many people do like a shape on your paper. I drew a letter M, I like that letter, you can imagine. Um, and uh, you can cut it out and when you do, it becomes artistic, all these symmetries, all the rotations, the reflections, everything in your paper just unfold into that fancy shape that you can predict uh, and so on. And it's so many choices for students where to take geometry, topology, algebra, and five-year-olds ask all kinds of questions. And you can make it more artistic by making more uh, involved shapes. So here I cut out our host's name, Julie, but I will open this later when I uh, have time to talk again. <laughs> so stay tuned. I can't wait. That's my first first time I've seen I've seen my name in that way. That's fantastic. Um, well, um, I'm I'm so excited to talk to all of you, and my head is spinning, and I've been taking notes. I, I find that I just wear the pencil down during these panels because there are so many 
so many incredible things that I, I want to remember. Um, I, I guess I want to start, um, I, I want to ask Bill, you know, so, so often um, as teachers, we're aspirational. You know, we, we, we are so hoping, and I think, I think the, I, th I think the, 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 uh, the example that you gave of, of the parent or the teacher walking along with the child at the, at the nature preserve, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's apt because we, um, we want to make meaning of things. And sometimes we think that just, just allowing a child's wonder is, is, you know, it's, it's not, deep enough. We're, we're applying our lens all the time. And, and I, I wonder, you know, with our vision so clouded by what we hope to achieve with children, um, how can we know if a learner-centered environment is actually learner-centered? I think so often we're, we're so much in our own way. How, how can we know? I think, um, most adults and parents, they want some measures, they, they want some metrics of how the child is progressing. And so uh, we rely on standardized tests a lot these days. Uh, standardized tests, as far as I know, do not assess the child's sense of wonder or the child's ability to think for herself or the child's curiosity. They just uh, mostly assess learned material, mastered material that's um, sent down, handed down by the adults. So I think one way is to in include um, these kinds of variables in our assessments. Um, have, you can have ratings and find ways of um, having teachers and uh, other and neutral adults assess is, is a child spontaneously interested in the world, curious, thinking for herself, does she exhibit a sense of wonder? And um, so that's one answer. Uh, another one is to introduce the teachers and the parents, try to get them to reimagine, get something back, um, recapture something of their own childhood and something of, of understanding the magic of the world. Um, if we can do that with adults, because um, adults want some something more in life usually. They find themselves dreary, leading dreary kind of routine lives and they would like to experience some of the wonder in life themselves so we can give them those opportunities. So those are my two of my thoughts right now. I think I've, I, I think I I've said... Jump in, I think. Yes, yes, please do, yes. But yeah, I've been thinking about that little story Bill told about the adult directing the child about what to think about the rooster and the chickens. And I think that this is, also talks to Sherry's assertion that as Americans, we're maybe not all that good at some things we should be good at when it comes to raising children. So for me, one of the hallmarks of a learner-centered education is who's doing the thinking and who's doing the talking. And, and I think that a lot of us have been sold in this idea that to be a good parent or to be a good teacher, it means we're always doing something, which means we have to be controlling or orchestrating. I've seen the same thing Bill talks about at a playground. I remember when my children were little, and they would be going down the slide or they'd be digging in the sand. I spent so much time just watching them and just <laughs> sort of my sense of wonder at what they were doing and exploring was, was fascinating to me. I would often see other parents, like their three-year-old would get on a slide and at the bottom of the slide, you could see the three-year-old had just had a great time. And the adult runs over and says, good job, good <laughs> sliding. Because if the parent's not praising, then somehow they're not being a good parent. We've, we've bought this idea that we always have to be doing something. And I know that this is the case when I work with teachers in schools and I'm coaching teachers, I'm often coaching teachers to stop talking so much. That, that instead of 70% of the time being taken up by the teacher voice, you know, I remember a friend of mine, he told me an adage once, whoever's doing the talking is doing the thinking. And I think we have a lot of classrooms where teachers are doing a lot of thinking and the kids learn fairly quickly that being a good student means sort of taking direction from the teacher, doing what the teacher wants them to do, accepting approval from the teacher, seeking approval from the teacher. Um, and I, so I think that's something that we really need to pay attention to. And so like Bill is suggesting, the more we can encourage adults to be with kids, put them in environments where they can flourish, um, even notice and wonder with them, 
But instead of saying, what does the rooster say, Sally? What does the rooster say? We can say, what do you see about the rooster? What looks interesting to you? Or we can watch their eyes and see if we can see what they're seeing and imagine what they're thinking about. Um, so I think that we need to, to talk less and observe more. Yeah. Yes. I think Sherry had something to say about that. I just wanted to say also, I think that as teachers, we make the mistake of thinking that observing is not active. Right. And I think observing and watching kids is, is the most powerful. And, and sometimes it's, it's the biggest work that we do. And we've undervalued that for so long that now we think that watching is doing nothing. So I think that that's a bit of a sea change too. So I'm sorry. So Sherry, please, I could see oh, you have something. Maria has something. I'm so grateful that you said that because I think that's very true that we have poorly defined what the roles should be and, and how we, sh you know, share power and support children. I wanted to comment, uh, you know, back to Bill's point and also to Mike's is this notion of what, you know, the, the, the parent who wants to teach the child about the, the sounds or say good job and try to think of things to say, that's our fault. That's our fault. We are a country that says the parent is the child's first teacher. I hate that line. The parent is the child's first everything. They are responsible for every single thing that goes on in that child's life. And the least that we can do is be the teacher. That, that, that the child is learning from the parent every minute of every day. And to say to a parent, but are you teaching your child? You know, are you, what, how are you teaching your child? Are you giving your child concepts? So parents come to the nature preserve and think, that their job is to like get in the way of their child's natural uh, engagement with the environment, with nature, with opportunity. Instead of asking open-ended questions, we feel like it's our job to cram stuff into their heads. And whether they're ready for it, interested in it, or if it's relevant or true. So a, a rooster does not say cock-a-doodle-doo. And a child knows that. So when a parent says that, the child is thinking, what's wrong with my mother? Instead of, wow, we're really talking about roosters here. Instead, the child is probably far more interested in the rooster's poop and the rooster's friends and how the rooster walks around and what he eats. And, and, and that's all our fault. We have to change that narrative. You know, uh, I know Maria's got something to talk about here. I just want to say, you know, it's interesting too. We say here all the time, listen, uh, school is everywhere you are. You're always learning, no matter where you are. If you're on a school bus, the school bus is school. If you're at home, your backyard is school. Wherever you are, you're learning. And so I'm interested in what you said, Sherry, about saying that, you know, when we say that the parent is the, is, is the child's first teacher, we already start separating learning from everything else. That's and right. learning is something that we're doing all the time and we're learning from everybody and everything. So um, thanks for mentioning that. Maria, you had something you wanted to add. I just want to say I love having parents at my activities. Not all uh, math teachers do so, but when parents, I always design for, the, for them to be there, to be active. And uh, I think with parents, you need to invite people to do things up front. So you direct them gently to be a part of, of the joy. So when we make snowflakes like this, we, I tell parents, well, if you make, make your own here, choose your color of your paper, always choose colors, always make math with colors. If you remember one thing about it, just have a lot of colors for your mathematics always. But um, when you make a complex snowflake, you will inspire children. That's your job, make your own project. If you make it simple and mess it up, you will show children that you are a learner too. Uh -huh. And we invite by telling people what to do, giving them their own scissors, their own paper, they are already busy and they are into it then. And they, they see, and we have an object called parent bingo. 
it's a card where it helps them to observe what they can notice. For example, observe a child ask a wild question that you never anticipated. Like um, uh, observe, uh, observe when a child just dropped an activity and picked something else. Observed uh, when a child returned to an activity, so on. So you give people observation pointers and then they learn to be better observers and that's your chance to kind of gently help people notice and wonder about learning. And parents can be a great resource if you ask them, okay, I need to know one thing from the past. Think about it. It will take you some time to think. What was your child interested in regarding whatever topic you're doing ever? That will give them something to do for the next 10 minutes, I promise you. And <laughs> because it's interesting, it's about their precious child, but it's a more creative thing. So that's just uh, something to anticipate with parents and invite them to be active learners too. Yes, yes. Um, so this might be a question for, for, for everybody. And, and I'm just wondering, um, if you could sort of speak to some of the characteristics that you see in um, emerging from learners who are in learner-centered classrooms compared to characteristics you see in teacher-centered classrooms. I, I think I see you nodding, Mike. So I'm gonna to go to you first. It's where's the energy and the motivation coming from? In teacher-centered classrooms, usually the energy and motivation is coming from the teacher. And so the teacher thinks it's their job to motivate the kids. Although, as Sherry said, kids come into the world already motivated. Um, so here's, here's a story that illustrates this. When I was teaching fifth grade one year, we were doing independent research projects. And the theme was conflict in US history. And so students had chosen a wide variety of topics. One kid was studying Jackie Robinson. Somebody else was studying Rosa Parks. Um, and Timmy was studying Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the Battle of Little Round Top from the Battle of Gettysburg from the American Civil War. Really specific, interesting topic. So it was a Friday and Timmy came up to me a little bit panicked and said, Mr. Anderson, are you gonna be in school tomorrow? I said, tomorrow, it's a Saturday. You mean Monday? He said, no, tomorrow. I know sometimes you come into school to do work on the weekends, you're gonna be here tomorrow. I said, well, I hadn't planned on it, but I guess I could be. This was before I had kids, so I could just you know, <laughs> come to school on a Saturday. And so he said, well, can I please come in tomorrow morning? I have so much to do on my model of Little Round Top. It's taking me so much longer than I thought it was to, to put it together. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. I can come in and do some work and you can come in. How about I'll say I'll be here from eight to 12 and you can come in during that time. He said, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. Well, another kid hears this and says, whoa, wait, Timmy's coming to school tomorrow? I got stuff I got to do on my project. Can I come in tomorrow? So I put out the notice to my class. I said, all right, here's the deal, everyone. I know it's crunch time. We got presentations coming up soon. Um, and I wouldn't let kids take projects home, by the way. That was part of where the franticness was coming from, is all had to be done in school. Um, and so I said, I'll be here tomorrow from 8 to 12. If anybody wants to come in, I'll send a note home to parents. You can come in and work on your, on your projects. I said, this is an ind indoor recess time. It's not a hangout with friends time. It's a time to work on social studies projects. So 11 out of 22 kids showed up on a Saturday morning to work on their social studies independent research projects. This was a non-graded assignment. Students had generated a lot of the questions. There were certainly topics and themes everyone had to touch on because this was around a, a social studies unit we had in school. But the kids had generated questions. Kids had chosen topics. They were choosing how they were presenting their projects. We had set time limits on presentations. They had to be between 30 and 45 minutes. And the kids were having a harder time sticking to 45 than they were in making it to 30. Um, and I can guarantee you that if this was a graded project, if in the end I was gonna slap a grade on it, we would not have seen that kind of energy and enthusiasm because then the whole thing would have been about meeting my criteria, doing what I wanted, jumping through my teacher hoops, and all the motivation would have shifted from kid to teacher. Um, it's just some, so when you think about what are the characteristics of, of a learner and centered environment, it's the kids who've got the energy and they're saying, I need to do this. I want to do this. And it's, and it's our job to guide and facilitate 
and help them with their learning because they can't just do it on, on its own. Learner direct, learner directed education does not have to be a free swim where we just sort of throw kids in a room and go do whatever you want. We do still have a role in structuring and guiding and supporting. Um, but I think that part of going back to what we were talking about before, part of the reason I think that we even feel like we're always supposed to be actively doing something. I think the name, the name teacher, the, the role of teacher, the title of teacher is a problem because it emphasizes us as the protagonist. And it's, it's bumpy, it's hokey, but I would so much rather have us be called learning facilitators because then it focuses on what we're actually there to do, which is not to teach, it's to help other people learn. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes I like to, I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's term that would ever catch on, but I like to just think of, think of the teachers at our school as the bridge, just the bridge. You know, it's nothing, you know, like you're going to be crossing into uncharted waters. You're headed into things that are challenging. We can be a bridge, but we're not, we're not there to, to do it for you or to even tell you where your bridge is supposed to go. You're, you're saying your destination. So I don't know. Sherry, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the benefits for us in these moments. Um, you know, as, as educators, as parents, as grandparents as whoever we are in a child's life, the benefits for us in letting, in letting our children lead, letting the learner lead? You know, that's a very lovely question. I think one of the benefits is learning just how competent children are and taking pride in that. Uh, I remember um, in a lab school that I ran, a parent, a couple coming to me very concerned about their uh, three, almost four-year-old child and, and was, was this child learning enough? Because every time they observed in the observation room, it appeared that all the children were playing and what could they possibly be doing all that time just playing? And I immediately took them, I said, let's just go into the observation room and watch together. And we were watching and, you know, just by luck, their child and one other child were, were uh, the two of them were in the block corner with a plank of wood and two matchbox cars. And they were letting the cars go from the top to see which car would win the race. And the parents said, see, look, they're just playing. And I said, actually, your child and that other child are doing physics. And, um, and, and your child is so incredibly intelligent because his need to understand about speed, motion, incline, all of these constructs, all at the same time, the teacher's nowhere to be. She's not 20 feet near them. They're driving this lesson. They're creating their their uh, their learning, their co-constructing their learning together as a team. Your child is brilliant, and what and and the parents they literally both sat up straight and said, "Tell us more about this." Like it had never occurred to them again because of our society saying to a parent, "What are you doing for your child? Where does your child go to preschool? Where is your child going to go to college?" All these very, um, you know, that these make-believe kind of standards that we impose on children, they really began to see the light that, that in fact their child was born learning, totally equipped, and that they, and then, then I, you know, then I deliver the, the final blow, which is to say, this is all your fault. Mm -hmm. You've created this child who is completely driven to do physics at three and three quarters years old. So I don't know what you want from me, you're already doing it. And at that moment, you know, we had a completely different relationship and they had a completely different relationship with their child, the teacher, the classroom. And every day after that, those parents would go into the observation room before they picked up their child to see what phenomenal stuff he was up to because of that. And, and that may be a really long-winded way to say that what we get from this is the incredible joy and affirmation that when we provide the right tools, environment, encouragement, affirmation of children, 
we get to see this magic that happens, which is that they figure this stuff out in, in very, very complicated and sophisticated ways. When, when teachers are teaching things like the cat is on the mat, <laughs> and I'll, I will say one more thing. Um, I was at the University of Pittsburgh for 14 years and taught in the graduate school and, and ran their lab school. And every single four-year-old in that lab school, and we have many of them, could read the word Roethlisberger, could read that word. And why could they read that word? Because he was the quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he was the most important man in all of Pittsburgh. And so every four-year-old could make sentences about him especially on Monday mornings <laughs> after the game. I mean, we would make hay, right? And, right? and so when learning is relevant, we get to be a part of something that is just magical. And, you know, and, and I forbid people to talk about the cat is on the mat. Who cares where the cat is? This is what reading is all about. Reading is a means to an end, not an end. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think you're right. I think, you know, and we love what we notice. Right, and I think that's that. That goes back actually to to Maria. What Maria was saying about you know she she gives the card, so parents can, family members and teachers can can ha have some you know things to hold on to. Notice these things because you'll love what you notice. We love what we notice. It it's ours now. It it's, it belongs to us, and we belong with it. And we love what we choose. It's a cognitive bias if you want to bring in that psychology, but uh, we love what we choose. We generate admiration. So I think that's how you can tell the environment and if you can get that benefit from it because if people choose, if everyone there has its choices, they generate a lot of love, a lot of discernment they become connoisseurs, including the teachers. What is your favorite uh, spatial transformation? If it's a child-led mathematical lesson, they have a favorite function, favorite shape, favorite number. They have all these favorites that ge generated the love. That's how I quickly tell. I ask children to name their favorites. If they never thought about it this way, they didn't have choices. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Bill, I, I, I know that you, you've, you've done some, some thinking and writing about how, how powerful grandparents are in the life of a, of a child. And I, I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how that sort of, um, that relationship helps to build children as learners and how how that maybe relates to, to learner-centered education. Yeah, it, um, I wanna say I totally, um, just quickly, I'll get right that, to that. You but if I may, I wanna, I wanna just say I agree with Tom, uh, Mike, I mean, Mike, that um, the energy of the child in, is one way to know of how things are going and in, in one of the um, benefits of a learner education. I under, my, the kindergarten teachers I've talked to say that's, uh, with all the academics coming in so early uh, in in the early years that the, the kids there's a tremendous amount of apathy the kids turn off and um, you're it's, it's really a problem so they're, they're lacking energy they may be angry but that's about it um, uh, and then in terms of Sherry and uh, and um, Maria uh, have talked about observing the kids and grandparents are particularly good at observing in a loving way, if I would say they, um, they seem, they just, uh, it's a general generalization, but they generally seem to just watching their children, their grandchildren, they love being around them, and they take delight in the, 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 the kids' natural behavior. They seem to appreciate them more than, they don't have so many ambitions, they just appreciate the children for who they are, and everything that the child does which probably includes a child's sense of wonder, uh, is just amazing to them. And uh, they're like, a, a captivate, they're like a, an audience is just captivated by something so wonderful. So, so many grandparents say that they, 
there's nothing better than being around my grandchildren. Um, it's like they get to go to, a, I don't know what the, what the analogy would be, a super movie or something, but it's just some super experience. And uh, what's important about this is uh, to just be appreciated for who you are as a child will give the child a confidence that is hard to get if you're always being judged by how well you're doing, what how well you did on this test, what school you got into, are you a disappointment to the parent because you didn't go here, uh, is your worth always contingent on your success, um, are you a, a worth more as a child if you get into Princeton rather than uh, the, the community college, uh, if, uh, and so on, um, and that, that's how it starts very early. And I think uh, it's very important for children to um, have what Carl Rogers called the unconditional positive regard that uh, grandparents so often bring. So some people have thought that grandparents would probably be the best parents because um, they just love their children, they, they love watching the children. They, they are good observers, they just observe. Um, I've talked to some people, they say, well, grandparents don't have the energy. Um, I don't know. A lot of kids have been brought up by grandparents and um, they do all right. It's interesting too. I think um, grandparents sometimes have an ability to make uh, the ordinary extraordinary. So, you know, I spent, you know, you can ask a child, what'd you do today? And they said, I spent the day with my, gran my grandparents. What'd you do? Well, we went to the post office. We went to the grocery yeah. store. We went to the shoemaker, it was fantastic. I saw somebody reheal a shoe, you know, and, and all of these things then suddenly become this incredible magical life. And imagine if we could have that, you know, going through our daily lives, how, how much happier we'd be. But Julia, so, yes, so go ahead, Sherry. Just to build on the grandparent thing, you know what grandparents bring is context and wisdom as well. So they have the, the privilege of, of history. Mm -hmm. They know that a child can throw a tantrum at two or get in trouble at 15 and they're going to be okay. Huh. A parent does not have that luxury. They are fixated on every single thing and they worry deeply about every single thing. And, and so, you know, I think the beauty of, of having access to grandparents is that it also provides this contextual balance and calmness. And there's a reason why children very often find, as Bill describes and you describe, this, um, this different relationship that a child might experience with their grandparent because the grandparent is not focused on what they did yesterday and are they going to do it again and if they do what's going to happen and how do you manage that and it's all up to me the parent to fix the the flaws of my child the grandparents like yeah whatever that's going to be <laughs> fine doesn't matter yeah it's never you know i often say to parents um who would be so worried i said when did you learn how to tie your shoes i i don't know five four or five is it on your resume no <clears throat> Okay, then it doesn't matter. Leave your child alone. Buy Velcro, right? Like stop obsessing. And grand grandparents have that level of wisdom. Yeah. They're like, who cares if they tie their shoes? Are they a good person? Do, are they loved? So I feel like that mix is very important. And, uh, you know, we used to have foster grandparents in early childhood programs. I don't know if they have them anymore, but it was a federally funded program and, and it was designed to put that layer of wisdom in classrooms. It was good for the older people mm -hmm. to be these mm -hmm. grandparents, but it was beautiful for the children. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that, well, I don't know if that still exists. Mike, I, I know you had something there. Yeah. Going back to the, the question you'd asked a while ago, which is what's a benefit for us. So I think one of the things that grandparents have going for them is that the pressure's off especially if they're a grandparent who's not actively parenting. So not the grandparent who's acting as parent where the kids are with them all the time. But I think that's one of the reasons why it's easier, um, easier to be in the presence of children and not feel like you have to do so much when you've got a different role. And I often say, you know, when I go into classrooms and teach demo lessons, it's the best of both worlds because I get to go in 
and have this awesome experience facilitating learning for high schoolers or middle schoolers or preschoolers, but I'm like the cool uncle. I breeze in, I do something awesome, and then I breeze out again, but I'm not in there for the, you know, the duration and not stuck in the mire of the challenge of the sort of wearing down that happens when you're with, you know, children for a long time. Um, so I think that that's something that, that also can help with that. Um, is, and, that's, and so that goes back to the other question, which is what do we get out of that? So when we feel, when we let go of the idea that it's our job to direct everything and that we have to be actively teaching all the time, it takes so much stress and pressure off. Um, it, it allows us to be a little more relaxed and to be in wonder of our children instead of trying to, to control them and do something to them. Um, and then something I just wanted to say, something Bill said a minute ago really struck me, the idea of unconditional acceptance so I think when you ask adults, parents or teachers, do you believe that children need unconditional love? I don't see anybody who says no. Everybody who answers that question as I ask it says, yes, of course, children need unconditional love. Yet so often the way we're interacting with children is around judgment. And that's one of those, that, those dangers of using that kind of praise I was talking about before. Good job sliding down the slide. I love when you're sharing with a friend, oh, that makes me so happy when I see you doing such and such. So even though we say we want kids to have unconditional love, we very often make our love for them or acceptance for them conditional on what they're doing. Because what we're really saying when we say in a classroom, I like the way you're standing so quietly in line right now, the translation for that is, I like you more when you're doing what I want. Um, and so that's, that's something that teachers can really work on and shift as they, if they want to move toward a more teacher or child-centric education, is shifting our language habits around how we interact with children so that we're using less judgment, um, and, less, and, less yeah. traditional praise. Yes. And what happens in those classrooms? when we make that shift? What happens to behavior there? Because I think that's a fear that some educators have and parents have. If I let my child lead, they're gonna go crazy and, and everything's gonna to be topsy-turvy and I'll lose all of my whatever power I had or whatever power they perceive they have. What happens in a classroom where children lead? Yeah, well, we've gotta be careful we don't get stuck in this either or mentality. That it's either the adult who has all the control or the child who has all the control. In a child-centered classroom, it doesn't mean that the adult no longer structures. We still need to teach routines. We need to make sure we're helping guide children so that they're being safe and kind and respectful. Um, but we also, going back to something that Sherry said earlier, we also have to go in with the belief that, of course, children want to be good. Of course, they want to do well. They're already motivated to be positive members of a community and be kind and respectful. They just maybe don't have the skills yet. They don't have the regulation um, yet to do it. And so we need to be there to support and guide. Um, so a really kind of classic, simple example of how it doesn't have to be either or is that in a classroom setting, we might have children co-create the norms or rules of the classroom with the adult. So the adult says, we need to have rules that help guide our work in here. Just like we have to all know what the rules are to play basketball or to play Monopoly. The rules let us play together effectively. So let's think together. What are some of your goals for this year? What do you want this classroom to look like and feel like? And we use those conversations to help us generate rules together with children so that the, the adult is still guiding and supporting. We're, we're still helping kids get there, but we're also counting on kids to have a really good, important ideas and having faith in their natural innate desire to be positive members of a group and to be kind and loving and, and empathic and all those things we want them to be. Yes, yes. It's funny when we, when we, um, when we work on project here, I'll, all of the teachers have their own projects as well. And so, you know, I, I was working on my project on citrus fruit and, uh, you know, kids were getting excited about things that they were doing and stuff. You know, I just said, listen, I, I'm working on this really tricky part here. You know, could you guys just give me about five minutes? I just really need it to be quiet for five minutes so I can figure this out. And everybody understood because everybody had encountered a tricky part in their project. Everybody had had a moment when they need, needed quiet. And so, you know, when you're side by side with them, it's, it's much easier. I was wondering, Maria, yes. Yes, what do you think? Oh, go ahead. No, you. Uh, have a no, oh, you. No, you. No, you. Okay. Uh, well, I'll be unfolding this so we have the time and speaking. And I'll be speaking uh, about the elephant in the room where 
Well, what would children do if the door were open? Would they stay with us and keep doing what we are offering? That's a mental experiment in design. I just offered, okay, everyone, design a math activity. Now imagine the door is open. Will children still be there doing your activity? Yeah. How will you change the activity if you had voluntary clients? Just children being there or not being there as they would. That's a big design change. Just open a math textbook and ask yourself that question. Would the chapter look like it does if children could up and leave? Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if not, how can we redesign? So that question parents ask, oh, everything will be topsy-turvy, everything. That's the acknowledgement that we are keeping children there and that what they are doing, maybe we are working with involuntary clients there in a sense. Ta-da! Mm -hmm. Wow! My name never looked better. <laughs> <laughs> I can send it to you and I hope uh, people try this at home and explore symmetries and so on if they choose to do so <laughs> and that's uh, what comes down to child-led design how would you design for children who are there and following their choices and Maria isn't this exactly one of the challenges we've seen with the move to at-home learning that this is one of the reasons why it's been so yes. so many children and families is that what kept kids engaged, meaning on task, was the structure of school itself because it wasn't the content, it wasn't the delivery. And, um, and this has really exposed one of the challenges that I hope, I hope we take the question that you just asked and take it to heart, not just for the next few months or the next year or however long this is gonna last, but in, in using this as an opportunity to redesign what we do, you know, to imagine, okay, so what happens if we have another prolonged period where children aren't going to be in these four walls? I also think it's interesting to me how we're romanticizing the classroom all of a sudden, where all of, everybody's saying, you know, well, of course we can't have great learning right now because the school is such the ideal environment. But when we were in the school, we were always saying, oh, we're so confined by these four walls. If only we could break out of the classroom structure. Um, I, I think the question you just posed is such an important one, that are we designing learning experiences that kids would choose to participate in? In, in my subject, um, people do this, romanticize is a good word, um, oh, let us teach children this or that, multiplication tables at five by heart, uh, formal algebra, what, whatever, I love formal algebra, confession. But whatever people do, they are like, oh, and we won't watch our children being taught that. It will happen somewhere and they will come back already having done whatever I want done, just as long. How would it feel if you had to watch the process of the child dealing with it? And if the child doesn't deal with that too well emotionally, and you get to see every minute of it. That's what a lot of parents are asking themselves. Returning back to their own math grief stories, I call them that grief stories. Let me tell you what happened to me in third grade, a lot of people tell me, uh, about mathematics in particular. So a lot of people are resurfacing this trauma and asking themselves, well, maybe something else to do? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I, I'm wondering, and maybe Bill could talk to this a little bit, you know, we, we, we have to communicate better with, with each other, with families, with our colleagues, with, with, with ourselves, actually, and, and, and find ways to communicate um, the importance of, of this kind of education for children. Um, we've been saying it, you know, people in pockets here and there, and, and I don't know why we don't have the traction that we need to really, to really make a difference. And I, I'm wondering if, maybe start with Bill, but think of, if everybody could think a little bit about how we get this message 
out in a way that really um, moves the needle? <clears throat> well, it's a difficult task. I think some of the um, ideas I've learned today about the importance in this discussion about the importance of observation uh, that, that every, all the panelists, my fellow panelists, panelists have talked about is getting the parent to observe how much a child is actually learning when they're playing, building things, uh, mucking around in a stream, and um, how much learning uh, actually occurs. Throwing a ball requires a certain amount of intuitive knowledge of physics to throw a baseball accurately. Um, so I, I think having the parent, I, this has struck me today that having the uh, bring, working with parents to be observers and I've heard repeatedly the, from the best child uh, centered educators, those who are really involved in it, that observation is key, that what the teacher really gets good at is observing and part of which is what the child really is eager, ready and eager to learn they get a knack for an art of knowing where the child is really going to take off. And of course, if the child is really interested in a topic, they'll read about it and then you won't worry about their reading because they'll just read. Uh, so this capacity to, uh, to observe and take time out to observe, I think if we can help teachers, uh, parents and teachers can do this jointly. I've, it's something I've taken away today. Um, and I'm, it's very important. I'm grateful for that. I think um, you, we can point to, some people in um, great people, great minds uh, like Einstein and others is, was one of your questions. Uh, who can you point to? And I think if you look at some of the, if you want a child to be successful, that's one thing. If you really want some kind of special quality, some, they didn't, some of the, like Einstein had trouble with school, but he had this sense of wonder all his life. Um, school is, very difficult for him. In fact, um, he almost uh, said he, after taking his final exams at a polytechnic institute, he couldn't do physics for a year. It just took the curiosity out of him, what he called the holy curiosity, um, to taking all these exams. So, um, uh, but what drove him was a sense of wonder in the universe. Um, if we can point to some of the great people, maybe that would help um, communicate. It's great. Yes. Yes. I think that um, one of the things we need to help parents overcome is the it worked for me syndrome. Um, very often parents will say, but I went through this kind of education myself and I've turned out okay. So, <laughs> you know, as a justification for keeping with the standard traditional practices we've got in school. So I tried something once with a group of parents and it was really interesting the impact it had. I was doing a parent talk at a private school in Los Angeles at a very high powered private school. Um, and I looked at the attire of the parents in the audience, and it was very clear to me how this question was going to go. I said, hey, I just have a question for everybody. And the talk, by the way, was about how to instill a growth mindset in children through language. So how do we shift our language practices to help children feel a sense of growth? Um, and I said to the parent group, I'm curious, in the roles that you have in the workplaces where you all work, how many of you are responsible for hiring or helping to hire people who come into your organizations? How many of you have a role in that? And it was 75 or 80% of the hands that went up. I said, so I'm curious, how many of you are looking for people who need to be managed and motivated to be productive? Or how many of you are looking for people who are self-motivated and have skills of self-management? And it was, it, you didn't even have to ask, it was a rhetorical question. Of course, everybody's looking for people who are self-managing and self-motivated. And so then that was then the sort of emotional shift or maybe the cognitive shift that helped us in the rest of that talk. And so what are our long-term goals for kids? Are we trying to create people who are good little worker bees, who are gonna to need to be managed and motivated all their lives, or are we looking for people who've got energy from within? And if so, how do we then shift practices to nurture and cultivate those characteristics? And so sometimes I think we have to help parents go through a little bit of an emotional or cognitive shift themselves to change sort of what their long-term goals are. Um, that's, that's one strategy I've found that helps. Yes. I think, I think it's interesting that um, we don't always apply this kind of learning method when we're working with each other, right? You know, 
we've all been to professional development where we're all called into a room and one speaker talks to us for two hours and then you know we have a break and then we're supposed to come back and sort of then do things with the information that we've been given and it's not a scenario that we would ever ask of our kids we would not <laughs> ask that of our children so i i'm just wondering how you know, if you, if you had some words of wisdom for administrators and people who maybe like you design uh, professional development for schools and for teachers, not just for parents, um, how, how we could make our learning more learner centered. Any thoughts on that from anyone? Yeah. Oh yeah, right on. One thing I think we can do, and I didn't make this up. I heard this from somebody else. One thing we might do is shift what we call professional development. What if we stopped calling it professional development and started calling it professional learning? There's a really simple shift that helps us focus on the goal. And then I think, I mean, in, a, in some ways you've answered the question by asking it, which is that we need to use the practices of best teaching and learning as we design learning experiences for each other. So we need to offer opportunities for differentiation, recognizing that all adults aren't in the same place at the same time needing the same thing. We need to offer meaningful choice um, with structure. We need to make sure there's purpose and belonging and connection. Um, all of those things that we, we know we need to have for good learning to take place, we need to design professional learning experiences with those in mind. And I know just what you mean. I went to a one-day workshop once on differentiation, and not once was the learning differentiated the entire day. So we were learning about differentiation, but we weren't experiencing it. And I think that's um, something we should always have our eye on. Maria, yeah. I, I think we need to do what we tell people to do ourselves. And I, I think, um, I like to think about this question being about learners being makers, not consumers. But we need to invite them to make their own whatever it is we're making. If we're learning mathematics, then they, they should make their own mathematics not a problem solved, but maybe create novel problem solutions, but problem pose too. Take turns. You give somebody an exercise, they give you one. You offer an activity to your teachers, invite them, each of them to design an activity and share. So this maker activity and in mathematics, you give someone a theorem to study, invite everyone to conjecture. And that's their own theorems. So every voice is heard, everyone belongs. It's a matter of inclusion, of power really. And then uh, people make their own entities and they uh, can do what can be done. Uh, it gets deep into the structural ch challenges here. And it's not just about messaging, it's about uh, making, changing the structure of how things are done. And yet within a workshop, we can have that magic circle where we make things our way. Like Mike said, go in, be the cool person, be the cool experience that's different and maybe changing and inspiring. Yeah. Yes. And just one last thing, and I know we're going a little bit, we're going a little bit over and I, I, I beg your indulgence. Um, I, I wonder, when I listen to this conversation, it's surprising to me how innovative it is. And in a way, how disappointing that it's innovative, but still it is innovative. It's not, um, it's not what everyone does. And um, I think sometimes we get caught in the idea of labeling things as a shortcut to um, being able to do them well or to value them. And um, it's, it may not seem ex as exciting as some technological thing, but this kind of teaching really is innovative. And um, I, I just wonder, you know, how how it is that technology has has become innovative and teaching like this is not. And I wonder how we can maybe Sissy Sherry with her hand raised. Yes. You know what? This is a an interesting observation. 
people that believe in child-centered teaching sometimes just think other people should get it and that they should see it and they should suspend their um, issues around judgment and control and just see that it works. But I really think the proof is on us and we have not done a very effective job of proving it. We all know it. There isn't anybody on this call that doesn't live and breathe this. Like uh, there's not another option for somebody on this call. And yet that's not enough. There is this professional deep responsibility about illuminating this for people who, who are not believers or who are, who are at risk. They, can, they can't afford the luxury of thinking this way. Uh, somebody in New York City would say, we have 1,100,000 children in our school system. We can't think this way. But they can. And so, um, and, and, and we would hear that at a district that has, you know, 350 children. Well, we have 350 children we have to worry about. We can't, we can't do that. So it, it's incumbent upon us to structure research. We need to prove what we know. So data works. People respond to data. People want proof. And so structuring the research, but then once the evidence is there, very often researchers think, there, I've done my job, I've proved it. But no, the next thing is how do we communicate the proof? And so there's, there's just bunches of research sitting on a shelf where people have proven it, but you, you, know, you can't, you have to really then make it popular. And, and, and I think we have failed there. I think that is, for me, that, that is a big, you know, I believe in taking responsibility, radical responsibility for the failures of our public education system. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that this is one of the places that we've fallen short. There are magnificent books. Bill has a, a magnificent book. Uh, last night in, in my thinking of this topic, I went to my shelf and pulled Carolyn Pratt's book, I Learn From Children. That is, the, that is the essence of what we're talking about. Who's really the learner here? It's the teacher. But how do we, we don't, we haven't proven it to people who are just, you know, in their defense, have too much responsibility to take the risk of thinking differently. It does require bravery. It requires bravery. And, and to be a true advocate for the child, to really say, this is not about policy, this is about children, their, their present and their future, mostly their present. What are we doing to children on a daily basis? If, if, if our children were with Maria, oh my goodness, we would be, we would be on Mars already. I don't know that I want to be on Mars, but you know, we would be we would be solving some of the most intractable world problems. We would Sherry. not, you know, if we if children had Maria as a teacher, that that's just a given. But we don't have that. Yeah, so we suffer. Well, um, I think you're right, but I also think that we have a great opportunity, and I think we have a great opportunity. Um, because we can, we can work toward this and we can help people to see that this is a wonderful way to teach and we can prove it. And, um, and I think in the end, um, it actually makes everyone in the room happier. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the teacher, the, the teacher, the parent, the families, the children, you know, we say that we're doing it for the children, and we are, but I, I tell you, I, I am also doing it for myself because it is a much more joyful way to live and to teach and to be with kids and to be in the world for myself. So um, if, I'm, if I'm writing the script for the commercial, that's part of it. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much to all of you. I do, I, I do think that we, are, we need to conclude our panel for today. It is as I've said on several of the panels, um, it is a subject that, that could go a lot longer. 
And um, I hope that we will all maintain our connections so that we can talk about this further in the future. But I want to thank all of our amazing panelists because um, you've generously shared your wisdom here today. And I, I, it has been so insightful. And I'm sure that um, I'm sure that everyone is feeling energized, not just the panel, <laughs> about what we've heard here today. So thank you again. And I will just say, I will just close today as we close all of our meetings here at Slate School with the kids. We say thank you very much and positive rice to you all. Positive rice, have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us here at Slate School. Thank you.